Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Sides, and this course is Principles of Macroeconomics, Chapter 12, or Chapter 25 in the Combination Book, Production and Growth. In, this, in the previous lectures, we've talked about international data, and with the production function, we've examined productivity. Now we will add to the conversation the link between policies and productivity, which leads to growth. The first part are the policies, and the second part are the effects of those policies. The first in a series of about eight um, is savings and investment. Recall from the previous lectures, we, a factor of production is capital. It can only be acquired by savings and, and or investment. When government creates policies which encourages savings and encourages investment, it is encouraging growth. Increasing capital requires investment, which comes from savings. Savings means delayed consumption. Do the consumer choose not to buy or consume anything now? You choose to consume later. And so when you choose to consume later, you are saving part of your um, financial resources. Government policies, laws, rules, or regulations influence the amount of savings and investment directly through interest rates and indirectly through policy. So the uh, monetary policy is um, in the U.S. is controlled by the Federal Reserve Bank. And monetary policy, which is also a government policy, um, would dic dictate directly through interest rates how much you, the consumer, will save and how much a business would invest. And then we also have indirectly um, through other policies, generally fiscal policies, and we can talk about that later. In addition to savings and investment, government policies can affect um, in in other area can affect growth in other areas. We're going to look at those some of those now. Um, the first one that we're going to look at, the second one actually that we're going to look at, is investment from abroad. When domestic residents, you and I, can um, save, our savings is used as an investment by foreigners sometimes. If, um, for example, a mutual fund, we might put um, money, invest in a mutual fund in emerging economies. In essence, what we're doing is we're saving, we're, we're saving our from consuming now in the hopes that we will get a bigger gain later and we can spend then. When we um, make an investment or save in a mutual fund in an emerging economy, we're, as, in essence, domestic residents saving and foreigners are investing our savings into their economy. There are two types of investments from abroad. They include the FDI or the Federal Direct Investment. Uh, a good example of this is when the Federal Reserve last year approved an application for the Bank of China to open up a branch in Chicago. Assuming uh, a Chinese management then you would have FDI because the bank would be owned and operated by foreigners. The second type of investment from abroad is what we call FP, as in Paul I, or for foreign portfolio investment. And um, an example of a foreign portfolio investment would be um, seeing a Walmart supercenter in Jinan, China. This is FPI because the U.S. financed the business, but all of the workers were Chinese. Now, if you try to determine or analyze which one is better, foreign direct or foreign portfolio, that's a topic for a more advanced course, such as international trade. But for right now, you just need to understand the concept that foreign direct investment is when, um, when you have your current, when you have a foreign investment coming into the country and they have um, employees and workers there from our perspective, that's foreign direct. And then for, foreign portfolio is when you have it going abroad and when you have it going abroad, our money goes abroad, but everything 
abroad happens locally. So it's domestic workers working in a foreign company. The next policy that government can use to spark or to stimulate growth would be education. Education via schools has historically raised wages by 10% in the U.S. That percentage is larger in poorer nations. When, um, we'll talk about catch-up effects later. It is an investment in, education is an investment in human capital or labor. It is not without cost and it can have a negative or positive effect. It can have a positive effect again because it will stimulate growth, economic growth. But it has a negative. It can have a negative effect in that, if the government policies are um, implemented, and you have a more educated workforce, that educated workforce may choose to immigrate with an E, immigrate out of the country to another more advanced country, and we call that brain drain. Health and nutrition is another policy, and it is another policy relative to human capital, improving human capital. A healthy workforce means a productive workforce. And so when the government creates policies that would improve the health and nutrition of its citizens, then we will see the benefits, the direct benefits of that in the form of productivity, which leads to growth. A good example of this is, uh, is looking at China just in the last 15 to 20, maybe 30 years. As their economy has grown, uh, the government has been able to um, increase its policies towards health and nutrition um, in the form of um, creating agencies that monitor how food is processed, how it's sold, when it's sold, um, so that the citizens, the workers, have much better health and better nutrition. And it's visibly seen in the fact, in the form of, if you look at the current generation, they are much more taller than the previous generations. Um, it was not uncommon to see grandparents, parents, and children together. And the children stood head and shoulders taller than the parents and the grandparents because of health and nutrition. Property rights and political stability. There is a correlation and possibly a causation. Some believe correlation. A lot of people think causation between property rights and political stability. Um, this relationship um, is um, the, the, the relationship is about whether or not the government encourages can encourage economic growth by protecting property rights which eventually promotes um, political stability. Um, what happens when a government fails to protect its property, uh, protect property rights, is we see political instability because of the uncertainty. Um, this eminent domain is one issue that comes up when we talk about property rights and political stability. An eminent domain um, is when the government takes private property for public use that we're not necessarily speaking to that um, primarily because it depends upon whether or not just compensation was given to the owner. When we talk about property rights and the ins ins instability, political instability, we're talking about not necessarily the government taking control of your property, but um, other individuals taking your property. So if you own acreages, acreages of land, and your neighbor decided to usurp some of that or take some of that, the, 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 the instability of you, the uncertainty of you keeping your property intact um, would cause political instability. We see examples of this on the continent of Africa when we see, um, if you will, turf wars over land and natural resources. So if I if, it, if I am uncertain whether or not I have property rights over my property, I am less likely to invest in that property. And if I'm less likely to invest in that property, then the, the country overall will see a decrease in growth, economic growth.
More details will be get, could, would be given in an advanced economics class, but when government adopts outward-oriented policies known as free trade or fair trade, as opposed to inward policies such as protectionism, then the country benefits with growth. Trade is considered a form of technology, and without any trade, each country would have to produce all, all that it consumed. So if the country didn't, without trade, if the country didn't produce it, then the citizens couldn't consume it. Um, to give you context, think about all of the things that are made outside of the U.S. and think of all of the things that are made, items that are made inside the U.S. And, and imagine what your life would be like if you could only um, consume by um, those goods and services that were made in the U.S. only. Now that you've wrapped your mind around that, now you see why it is important to have free and or for fair trade. Trade is more difficult with landlocked countries such as on the continent of Africa. Not impossible, but much more difficult. And because of the difficulty, you see less growth. Research and development is another area or policy um, area that governments can create policies to encourage or stimulate economic growth. Um, you might hear also innovation. Our current president has used innovation, the key term of innovation. And so we're also speaking, when we, you hear innovation, you, hear, you are to think of it synonymous with research and development. Innovation policies or research and development or R&D policies are policies that promote um, innovation and those are good policies. There is relative to economic growth. There are some opponents who would argue that innovation happens in the private sector, not in the government sector. But if government did not create innovative friendly policies, it would make it more difficult for research and development to occur. The final policy consideration is population growth. Population affects the size of the labor force. A larger population equals larger total output. A larger population, however, does not in, uh, mean a higher standard of living for every citizen or wealth distribution. Um, example of this, again, is China. Um, they have a large population, um, so we could assume more output but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone within that large population res, um, is experiencing a higher standard of living. When we talk about population growth, um, government policies may affect the living standards in three different ways. First, when you have a large population or increased population growth, it stretches the natural resources. And when it stretches the natural resources, basically you have um, more, po more people chasing the few resources. For example, in China, they are experiencing currently um, water shortages and outages. Um, there's issues with, um, they have um, issues with energy um, and they've resorted to coal, which has created pollution. And so you have those um, issues that are relative to a large population growth. The second issue is dilution of capital stock. Um, remember that a large population um, means um, means um, we um, the capital when we divide capital per person, then that means if we have a large population, that would mean that the there's a lower standard of living because we are uh, averaging the or spreading or diluting capital over the large population. So that means each one gets less. Uh, we see this in the education system. Um, when we have uh, large classrooms of 30 and 40 students per teacher, and this is an example of dilution of capital stock. The third and final 
issue with population growth is uh, promoting technological um, progress. In the case of China, the government created a one-child policy, but there are some exceptions to that one-child policy. In the U.S., um, before an imbalance, before there is an imbalance based on population growth, um, you'll see before there was a move of more vocal conservatives and some radical groups, you would see the government would encourage control, population control through public service analysis. Uh, public service announcements, excuse me. Um, in China, they had the one child policy. Um, and in each case, what you see is um, more people would mean more technology, but it would also mean um, the other drainage of resources. And so the government would, if government wants to curb population growth, they'll create policies that would curb growth. And if they wanted, if they started to see a negative growth, then they would create policies that would encourage population growth. This concludes this segment of our lecture where um, we were speaking about the first part of the relationship between public policy and economic growth. The next lecture and the final lecture for this chapter will be the second portion of this um, relationship between economic growth and public policy where we talk about the effects that public policies will have on economic growth. I look forward to speaking to you then.